Going back to the, I believe the first video associated with this chapter, we talked about bonds are issued uh, so that corporations can raise money as well as you know governments can raise money as well. So the federal government can issue uh, you know bonds, whether it's T bonds, short-term bonds such as T notes, or pure discount bonds within one year called T bills. And again, in all three cases, they are issued to um, raise capital. Again, they're one raise money to fund government pro, uh, programs. Um, municipal securities. Um, when we say municipal securities, we're talking about municipal bonds. Uh, this these they, these again would be debt issues associated with state and local governments. Um, varying degrees of default risk. It really depends on which state is issuing the bond, which government is issuing the bond, um, and it's rated similar to corporate debt, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit later here uh, on today. Um, the interest that is received from a municipal bond is tax exempt at the federal level, and depending on the state, it might be exempt at the state level as well. Um, Again, municipal bonds are issued by state and local governments to raise funds to fund government programs associated with the state. Um, and when they say default risk, as opposed to the federal government, um, the state and local governments can go into default. In fact, the state of Illinois um, had a huge credit rating downgrade about uh, six, seven years ago. Um, I think their uh, government bonds are the lowest rated in the country. I think they have what's called a triple B rating, uh, which is the lowest uh, rating that any state bond holds right now. And we'll talk about these ratings a little bit later on today. Now, one thing that you need to know about municipal securities is um, they are tax exempt, as I mentioned before. Thus, if there's a taxable bond with a yield of 8% and a municipal bond that is yielding 6%, if you are currently in a 30% federal tax bracket, which bond do you prefer? Well, if you take on the taxable bond, which is going to provide you a before tax yield of 8%, so this is a before tax yield, BT, you take 8% and then you multiply it by one minus 0.3, so you wanna figure out what you're gonna have after taxes, and so you end up having an after-tax yield of 5.6%. Thus, the after-tax return that you get on a corporate bond is 5.6%. What about the municipal bond? The municipal bond is going to be exempt from federal taxation. So when it comes to a municipal bond, both the before-tax yield and the after-tax yield should be the same because there's no taxes associated with it. Thus, in this case, you would prefer the municipal bond because your after-tax return would be 6%. Now, at what tax rate would you be indifferent between the two bonds? Well, in this case, you would take the before tax yield associated with the corporate bond and then multiply it by one minus T, T referring to the tax rate, and then setting it equal to the municipal bond rate of 6%. Deriving and solving for T, the tax rate at which you would be indifferent between choosing the taxable corporate bond and the tax exempt municipal bond would be 25%. Okay, now let's go back a few slides and talk about certain characteristics associated with bonds. Okay, now um, you have to know the difference between debt and equity. Um, when we talk about bonds, debt, so if you're a bondholder in the company or versus an equity owner in the company, you have different privilege, privileges and different rights. Um, for example, if you own equity in a company, you, own, you have ownership stake in the company, right? Which provides you a vote in terms of who are going to be the board of directors in the company. The board of directors are the ones that are going to potentially hire and fire executives, CEOs, managers, and so forth. Dividends are not a cost of doing business. So dividends that shareholders receive are not considered a cost of business and therefore are not tax deductible. All right. Um, down here it says all equity, an all equity firm cannot go bankrupt merely due to debt since it has no debt. And the dividends are not a liability of the firm and thus stockholders have no legal recourse if dividends are not paid. Now on the flip side, when it comes to debt, if you are a bond holder, you do not have any ownership interest you, since you are a creditor, you are providing credit to the company. 
you don't have any voting rights, okay? The interest is considered a cost of doing business and is tax deductible from the company's perspective, not from the, from the investor's perspective. However, you as a bondholder, you as a creditor, do have legal recourse if interest or principal payments are not made to you, thus if they are missed. And one thing you have to keep in mind is that if the company takes on excess debt, debt uh, it can lead to financial distress or bankruptcy. All right, so you need to know those differences between a debt bondholder versus an equity owner. Now, you have what's called a bond indenture. Bond indenture is just a fancy way of saying what's in the bond contract between the issuing company as well as the bondholders. It's going to go over the terms of the bond, the total amount of the bonds issued, uh, a description of property used as security if applicable. It's going to mention anything about a sinking fund provision. Sinking fund provision is a provision put in the bond contract that states how the company will set aside money to make sure that they are paying interest payments as well as whether or not they'll have enough money at maturity to pay you back your $1,000. So it's a it's a good thing from, from the bondholder's perspective in that it's a provision that forces the company to set aside money to pay back the creditors. There's a call provision. And again, a call provision allows a company to call the bonds off the market and reissue new ones at a lower price. This is not ideal for the bondholder. Bondholders would probably prefer a call provision not included. And then there's some other protective covenants that detail whether or not uh, you know, the company can do X or do Y and you know, kind of restrict them on certain investments that may prohibit them from making proper interest payments down the road. But I would not worry about protective covenants for this class. Okay, uh, one thing that you probably need to be familiar with uh, is securitized bonds as well as seniority. Bonds that are backed by some type of security or collateral um, are better for you. They're safer because if a co company ends up going into default on their bonds, if they have some collateral that they can use to sell off to receive cash and then pay you back your money, that's a good thing. Um, Mortgage-backed bonds, this would be another example of collateral. Um, there are bonds that are called debenture bonds. These bonds are unsecured, which implies they have no collateral behind them. These bonds are very risky because if there's no collateral behind them and the company goes into default on their bonds, then there's nothing for them to sell as collateral to get cash to pay you back. Seniority, uh, there are senior bonds and there are junior bonds. Obviously, if you are holding a senior bond, you are going to get paid first before somebody who is owning a junior bond. So here, the coupon rate that gets paid out to a bondholder depends on the characteristics of the bond when issued. So if we're looking at this, which bonds will have the higher coupon? Okay, before we get into the various characteristics, please note that higher risk bonds are going to carry a higher coupon rate. Okay, because think about it from this perspective. If you are a bondholder, and you invest, you buy the bonds of a very risky company, you are taking a risk. And to be enticed by taking on that risk, instead of paying you maybe 5% interest, they should be paying you 8 or 9% interest. All right, so higher risk companies need to pay out a higher coupon rate. So if we're looking at this first one, secure debt versus a debenture, obviously a debenture is more risky. It's riskier, therefore it's gonna carry a higher coupon. Subordinated debenture versus senior debt. Uh, subordinated implies that it's junior debt, so we know that junior debt is riskier than senior debt, therefore the subordinated debenture will carry a higher coupon. A bond with a sinking fund versus one without. Um, if a bond has a sinking fund, then it's safer, therefore the one without the sinking fund is going to be riskier and therefore carry a higher coupon. And then a callable bond versus a non-callable bond. Again, if a bond has a call provision, you know it's riskier to the bondholder because the bonds can get called off the market. Therefore, a callable bond is riskier and therefore should carry a higher coupon. Last thing for this particular video, bond ratings. 
We use bond ratings to rate the credit rating of companies that issue bonds. We do this at the, at the corporate level, and we also do this at the state government level in terms of when they issue bonds. If you are a high quality or high grade company, which means you have good financial statements, you're, you are highly profitable, you, are, you, are, you have good growth long-term, you're going to have a high credit rating. So companies like Apple, Amazon, Walmart, when they issue bonds, they're going to carry probably the Moody's AAA rating or the S&P 500 or the S&P's AAA rating. Now, companies that uh, probably are one or two grades down are considered medium grade. Their capacity to pay back interest and the principal is strong, but they are susceptible to changes in market circumstances. Um, and then below that, you have uh, BAA and then the S&P's triple B. Their capacity to pay off the interest in the principal is adequate, but if adverse market conditions present themselves, this could impact the firm's ability to pay. Now, there are what's called low-grade bonds and then even very low-grade bonds. Um, if you find a company that is issuing bonds and they have credit ratings down in this area, I would highly advise you probably not to invest in these bonds. Chances are they won't be able to pay you back. And especially with a bond issue that is considered very low grade, they are on the verge of default and may not be able to pay you back any interest whatsoever. That said, if you were to buy bonds associated with a low grade or a very low grade, they're going to make very high coupon payments. Um, you know, you think about it right now, the average interest paid on a bond is probably around two to three percent for a very high grade bond. When it comes to these low grade and very low grade bonds, they are probably paying anywhere between eight and 13% in terms of coupon payments. Now that said, you are taking on a huge risk when you invest in these type of bonds. And we'll pick up on the next video.